Well, good morning. My name is Nate. If we don't know each other, I'd love to meet you at some point. Would you open a Bible with me to Colossians chapter 3? This is on page uh, 1044 in the Bible that's provided there, if you'd like to use that particular Bible. Um, In the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul is trying to get the church to lift their eyes up to the things above where Christ is. And I think that that's interesting because I was told growing up that it was possible to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you ever heard of that? He's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. Paul does not seem to think that way. Paul thinks that having your eyes up, thinking about things that are eternal, thinking about the things of God, that that is actually what can make the church a lot of earthly good. Our tendency, I think, the reason that Paul has to write a letter like this and that it's still relevant today is because our tendency is for our eyes and our lives to drift down. Down away from things that are eternal to things that have an expiration date down away from the things of heaven to the things of earth, down away from the things of God to the things of us. And when this happens, the church becomes something other than a community centered around Christ, which is what the church is supposed to be. The church is meant to be a community centered around Christ. And where is Christ, he says in Colossians 3? He's our life and he's above. And so when we begin to drift down, we inevitably have to center around something other than Christ. And so when this happens, the church becomes any number of things. The church can become a social group where it's just a place to make friends. The church can become a voting block, a place to advance cultural and political causes. The church can become a service provider, a place with programs to have various needs met. The church can become a community service group, a place to rally people, to clean up the city. The church can become a character education program for society, a place to form character in future generations. The church can become an event that you attend on Sunday. It's a place to have spiritual experiences or get a pick-me-up. But in Colossians, Paul is writing to lift our eyes back up, to see the majesty of who Jesus is. Because he knows that if we see Jesus, that we will center around him. And it's by being centered around Jesus that the church actually can be a force for good in the world. So today, as we look at this Next section in Colossians, verses 12 through 17. I just want to ask this question. How do we live as a Christ-centered community? How do we live as a Christ-centered community? So that's what the sermon's about, how to be a Christ-centered community. We're going to go through the text, and we're going to see five things that Paul says. And these are basically just the five commands of the text, so we're just going to walk right through it. So that's the outline Here's number one. To be a Christ-centered community, first, remember Christ's love. Remember Christ's love. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on these things. Before Paul tells the Colossians to do something here. He wants to remind them who they are. See, what the church is supposed to do should flow out of what the church is. The church is a community of people that are loved by God. That's what the church is. Look at the three words that Paul uses to describe the church's identity here. He says, first, as God's chosen ones, Chosen ones. What does that mean? What does it mean that God has chosen the church? 
It just means that this is the group of people that God has called out from the darkness by name. He has picked us. He has selected us. The, um, the name of this doctrine in the Bible is the doctrine of election. God chooses. And this is true throughout the pattern of the Bible. God chose Abraham. And he said, Abraham, in you and from your family, I'm going to do something for the whole world. All the families of the earth will be blessed through your family. God chose Abraham. God chose David from amongst his brothers and also amongst all of Israel to say, I'm going to build a kingdom for you, through you. When Jesus was on the earth, Jesus chose disciples. He said, come follow me. And now Paul says that that is what the church is. The church is a community of people that God has chosen. It's a group of people that he's picked. And who does he pick? God has chosen those who are in Christ. He says in Ephesians 1. He has chosen us in Christ. God has decided that the group of people in the world that he's going to save are the people who are in Christ through faith. What's unfortunate is that this doctrine has become in the church more of a debate than a delight. But here, Paul is reminding us that this is good news. God has chosen a people in Christ. So come. That's the first word. He says, therefore, as God's chosen ones. Then the second word he says, holy. The word holy just means to be separate, to be set apart, to be used for a unique purpose. That's what the word means. And this means that God has chosen those in Christ for himself. The purpose of the church is to exist for God. We're holy. We're to be used for God and his purposes. And this is an incredible act of love. And that's the third word. We are chosen, we are holy, and we are loved. God has chosen us for himself as a treasure that he delights in. Think about that. Have you experienced the love of God? How do you know that you are someone that God loves? And the answer is in Christ. You look to Christ. God, because of his love, sent Christ. God loved the world in this way, John 3.16 says, that he gave his son. So Jesus coming to the earth is an act of God's love. It's a sign of God's love. Romans 5.8, that Evan read earlier, says that God shows his love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus' coming to the earth is a sign of God's love. It's a way of God showing his love. And Jesus dying once he came is a way of God showing his love. And in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, Paul writes, because of God's great love that he had for us, he made us alive together with Christ. So how can you know God's love how can you know that you are loved by God? The answer is in Christ. You look to Christ. You trust in Christ. In Christ, you see that God sent the Son. In Christ, you see that Jesus died for sinners. And in Christ, you see that Jesus, who was raised from the dead, can also be your resurrection. In Christ, you can see that God wants to raise you from the dead. He wants to rescue you from your sin. He wants to rescue you from the expiration date that exists 
on this planet. He wants to rescue you. Where do we see God's election, his choosing, his holiness, and his love in Christ? This is who the church is. In order for the church to be a community that's centered around Christ, we have to remember our identity. We have to remember Christ's love. And everything that the church is meant to do should flow from who the church is. The church, most fundamentally, is not a social group, a voting block, a character education program for society, an event that you attend on Sunday. The church, most fundamentally, is a group of sinners who are loved by God in Christ. That's what the church is. One of the ways that we remember Christ's love is by giving thanks. And this is why three different times in verse 15, 16, and 17, Paul tells us to give thanks. Look at verse 15. At the end, he says, and be thankful. Then in verse 16, he says, sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then in verse 17, He says, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Three different times, three in a row. He says, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. And this is what he's prayed for them already in Colossians chapter one, verse 12. He prays that they will joyfully give thanks to the Father. Why? Why should they give thanks? Because the Father has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In order for someone to give thanks, it assumes that there's something to be given thanks over. And Paul says, remember Christ's love. One of the ways you can do that is create the habit of giving thanks. Do you have the habit in your life of giving thanks, of practicing gratitude? Did you know that's actually a habit that you can form? Often, whenever we give thanks, we we thank God for the material, the physical blessings that he's given us. And that's a good thing. We should do that. But that's not what Paul means here. Here, Paul means the spiritual blessings that we have. And he says in Ephesians 1, God has given us every spiritual blessing. And how has he done it? In Christ. By giving us Jesus, he has given us everything. As a church, if we are going to be centered on Christ, then we've got to remember Christ's love. We've got to remember our identity here. Most fundamentally, this is a group of people who are sinners, who are loved by God. And how are we loved? In Christ. Second, if we're going to be a community centered around Christ. Second, we need to wear Christ's clothes. We need to wear Christ's clothes. Look at verse 12, the rest of it. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on, and then he's going to give a list of things. And then again in verse 14, above all, put on. Do you see that? In verse 12 and 14, the verb is put on. And this is a word that's used to refer to how people ought to put on clothes. So we're supposed to dress with Christ and his clothes. How many of you know that what you wear communicates something? In fact, many times you can actually identify somebody by what they're wearing. Paul says that the community of people 
who claim to know Christ's love should wear Christ's clothes. So what are Christ's clothes? He lists seven things. Let's talk about each one of them. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on, here's the first one, compassion. Put on compassion. Compassion is literally a heart that moves or a heart that breaks. It's feeling what others are going through. It's caring about people. Judgment looks at someone in their mess and says, you should have worked harder or you shouldn't have gotten into this mess or you should have known better. That's what judgment says. Compassion says, I don't know how we got here, but how can I help? How can I help? Christ clothed himself with compassion. When he saw the mess that the world was in, what did he do? He rolled up his sleeves and he came as a human being. And John 3, 17 says, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. That's compassion. Are you a person who wears compassion? Do you ask questions? Do you listen? Are you interested in others? Do you try to see the world from another person's perspective? Paul says we should put on compassion. Next, he says we should put on kindness. Kindness. Kindness is using your resources in a way that's beneficial to others. It's loaning someone your strength. This could look like a neighbor helping out with the yard. It could look like a sister sharing her popsicle. It could look like a roommate doing the other roommate's chores or picking up groceries for the house. Christ, when he came to the world, clothed himself with kindness. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's a demonstration of kindness. Ask yourself, do people feel more valuable to you than your schedule? Does your humor build up or cut down? Do your actions make wherever you go a better place to be? Third, Paul says, put on humility. Humility is seeing yourself rightly. It's seeing yourself in relation to God and to one another. It's not taking yourself too seriously. Humility causes me to approach you as a peer, regardless of our differences, regardless of the difference in how much money we make or our education or our, the neighborhood we live in or our ethnicity or our background. Humility is the president of my college at the beginning of the year on move-in day, showing up in a t-shirt and some shorts while all the other executives are in the office with their suits and ties on, loading boxes, helping people move in. That's humility. Christ demonstrates humility. When Christ came into the world, he clothed himself with humility. He put on humility. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. But instead, he emptied himself. Next, Paul says, put on gentleness. Gentleness is acting with the appropriate strength. It's adjusting your approach to the needs of the situation. Uh, one um, author said, it's the difference in the force that you use picking up a contact lens and picking up a baseball. You have the same strength, but you handle one differently. Why? Because you understand that 
There are certain contexts where what's required is not your strength, but to gear down and meet with gentleness. This is the decision to enter conversations, not from a position of who I am and what I've done or my knowledge and my insight and my background and my accomplishments, but instead to gear down when necessary. This is a professor responding softly to a silly question. Christ, when he came into the world, clothed himself with gentleness. It's his gentleness that entered the world as an infant. It's his gentleness that welcomed sinners and tax collectors. It's his gentleness that welcomed children when the world was trying to send them away. It's his gentleness that was being mocked on the cross. While he's hanging on the cross, they're saying, I thought you were some king. I thought you had some kind of power. But he recognized that what was needed in the moment was not him powering up, but him gearing down. That's gentleness. Paul says that is what the community of Christ ought to be known for. Paul says, put on patience. Patience is the decision to go the speed of another person. How well do you wait? How do you make people feel when you wait? God is incredibly patient. When he introduces himself to the nation of Israel, he he describes himself as someone who is slow to anger. That's patience. In history, God is very patient with humanity. In 2 Peter 3, he says, look, there are people who say, Jesus isn't real, God isn't real, because he said he was going to come back, but he hasn't been back yet. So if he's real, where is he? And he says, do not understand him as being delaying his promise. Instead, he's being patient. He wants to give you time to repent. This is the kind of God he is. And isn't this how God also deals with us? He's patient with us. Some of us have been struggling with the same things for years. And God is patient. He describes growth as spiritual fruit, implying it's like a seed that gets planted and then you wait to see the growth. If this is who our God is, if this is who Christ is, this is who we ought to be. Then, verse 13, Paul says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. He says, bear with one another and forgive one another. That's what we're supposed to wear. Let's talk about forgiveness first. Forgiving one another means we cancel the debts that someone owes us. When someone wrongs us, it's like a debt that they now owe. Forgiveness is when we say the debt is canceled. Forgiveness is when we treat someone as if you do not have to pay for what you've done. The debt has already been paid. That's forgiveness. We are called to forgive one another. Why? Because that's what Christ has done for us. Just as, he says, in the same way that the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. This means there's not a limit on forgiveness. This might take time. 
but we are called to forgive. But not everything in our lives is something to be repented of. And not everything is something that needs to be confronted and forgiven. In these moments, what's needed is that we bear with one another. To bear with one another is just a fancy way of saying, put up with each other. Put up with each other. In the church, because we are rescued from from everywhere, in Christ, this is chapter 3, verse 11, right before this section. In Christ, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. That means in the church, you can expect there to be lots of differences and lots of things that are just going to make you feel weird and awkward and hurt your feelings. And those things are not all necessarily sin. Part of what it means to be this community is to put up with it, to put up with one another, to bear with one another. The church is meant to be a place where we can overlook some shortcomings, where we are slow to be offended. And then Paul says, verse 14, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. By above all, I don't think he means, here's the list and, oh yeah, by the way, love is the most important. I think he means, he's using clothes language. Put it on over all this stuff. Love is the sum of these things. Love is like the belt that if you click it in, it's all going to stick together. If you've got love, you'll have compassion and Kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. You will bear with one another and forgive one another if you've got love. Because it's like the the bond. It's the thing that clicks it all in place. This is why when he describes love in 1 Corinthians 13, he lists these things. That's what love is. He says, so put on love above all. The, the, The overalls, the coveralls that the church wears is love. This is what the world ought to see when it looks at us. This, Jesus said, is how the world will know that you are my followers if you love one another just as I have loved you. If we are going to be a Christ-centered community, then we have to wear Christ's clothes. Number three, If we're going to be a Christ-centered community, we've got to referee in Christ's peace. We've got to referee in Christ's peace. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule or referee your hearts and be thankful. What is the peace of Christ? What does that mean? I think the peace of Christ refers to the peace that Christ accomplishes for us. And Christ accomplishes peace in two respects. First, Christ accomplishes peace for us with God. At one time, we were hostile with God. We were at war with God. But now we have peace with God. How does that peace come about? Only in Christ and in his blood that was shed on the cross. This is Romans chapter 5. Listen. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, or since we've been declared as being good or right in the eyes of God and his law, since we have been justified by faith, faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does this peace come about? Through Jesus. We have peace with God. Paul goes on in Romans 5 to say, God proves his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, how much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? Christ's death secures peace for us with God. Do you know 
where you stand with God? Do you know where you stand with God? In Jesus Christ, you can be absolutely confident, totally assured of what your relationship with God is. You do not have to fear that God's got some hidden agenda against you or that on the last day that you're going to find out, well, he's actually got this whole long list of things that you need to be punished for. That is not how God views you if you are in Christ through faith. In faith, we can have peace with God. You can go to bed tonight totally confident about where you stand with a holy God. If this is what you need to hear today, hear it. Your good deeds and even your desire to do good deeds even your sincerity of ah regret over the bad things that you've done. Those things do not bring you peace with God. God does not look down from heaven and think, well, because you feel bad enough about what you've done, then I can accept you. God offers you something much better than that. He offers you his son and he says, trust in him. We all have gone astray like sheep, but on him I have placed your punishment. On him are the wounds that can bring you peace. Trust in him. So Jesus, the peace of Christ, is peace that Christ has accomplished for us with God. But in Christ's death, he has not only secured peace for us with God, but also peace for us with one another. That is, he has made it possible for us, even in our disagreements, even in our differences, even in our hurts, to be one with with each other. The key text for this in the New Testament is Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 19. We don't have time to unpack it today. I'm just going to read it for you because it's beautiful. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away, talking about Gentiles, you who were far away have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might reconcile both to God in one body. I'm sorry, I jumped to the next line. So that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this, verse 16, so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put to death the hostility. Verse 17, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace, to you who are far away and peace to those who are near for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household in Christ. The hostility that exists between people can die On any wall that divides us, Jesus can be a door. This is why Paul says just before this section in Colossians 3.11, in Christ, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. And what does he say that this peace ought to do? Verse 15, he says, you were called to this peace. In one body, you're to be one, you're to be united. And then look at what he says, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. What does that mean? When I first read this, I assumed that the word rule meant Jesus is king. And so we have peace because he's king. But that's not actually what the word rule means here. Instead, it's a word that means to referee. It refers to the person who's in charge of a sporting event. 
And what does an umpire do? What does a referee do? They make sure that the game is played according to the rules. And Paul says, as you think about the community and how it ought to operate and how you guys ought to play together, the peace of Christ should be what referees you. It should be what makes sure that you live appropriately together. The peace of Christ. His blood-bought peace is what should referee. This means that when we relate to one another, even in sharp disagreement and debate, our attitudes and actions towards one another should be policed or refereed in light of Christ's death. So here are some questions that we should ask. Is the way that we're speaking to one another right in light of Christ's peace that he died for? Is the way that we're speaking about one another right in light of Christ? Matthew 5, 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Part of experiencing Christ's peace is wearing Christ's clothes. James 3.18 says, this is such a cool verse. And the fruit of righteousness, that is all kinds of good works, righteousness, all kinds of good stuff. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. A harvest of righteousness comes from people letting the peace of Christ rule. Here are some things to think about as it relates to letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. This is from Jonathan Edwards. I've kind of translated some stuff to make it a little, make more sense in modern English. He said, pride makes you more aware of others' faults than your own. But humility disposes you to be far more aware of your own faults than others. Pride leads you to speak of others' faults with contempt and disdain. Humility leads you to speak of their faults with grief and mercy. Pride leads you to separate from people who have criticized you or that you have criticized Humility leads you to stick with people in tough times and not give up on them. Pride leads you to confront because you like winning or to avoid confrontation because you don't want to lose. If you overlove confrontation or you never do confrontation, you may have pride. Humility only confronts when it's necessary. In a Christ-centered community wearing Christ-centered Close. we can experience peace with one another. The peace of Christ can referee our community. Number four, if we're going to be a Christ-centered community, we've got to welcome Christ's word. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. What is the word of Christ? The word of Christ can refer to a few things. I think most centrally, it's the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done. It's the news about Jesus' death and resurrection and how it saves. It's what we call the gospel. That's the word of Christ. The word of Christ can also refer to the Old Testament and the New Testament, the scriptures, the Bible, because the scriptures themselves testify about Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And the scriptures are given to us so that we can be wise for salvation through faith in Christ. So I think it refers to both of those things. To be rightly Christ-centered is to be Bible-centered, and to be rightly Bible-centered is to be Christ-centered. This is why one of our values as a church is to be word-centered, and that way we can just mean both of them by saying we want to be word-centered. 
Paul says, let the word of Christ, let the gospel, let the scriptures dwell richly. Let the word live here. Let it make a home in you and among you. And is it supposed to be in or among? One author said, Paul couldn't conceive of the word being in someone and not becoming among them. And he couldn't conceive of it being among them, but not being in them. So it's both. The word of Christ needs to be dwelling in me as an individual, and it needs to be dwelling in us as a community. And the same is true for you. What does it mean to dwell richly? John Piper says it means two things. First, it means let there be lots of it. Let the word be everywhere. And acknowledge its riches. Acknowledge how valuable it is. Does the word of Christ dwell richly in your life? Do you read it and meditate on it? In your family? How could you give the word a more prominent place in your home? Just as you think about your family rhythms, how could you give the word a more prominent place in your home? And as a church, what does it mean for the gospel, the word, to dwell richly among us? I think in our worship gatherings, it looks like us saturating them with scripture. We want to read scripture and listen to sermons with our Bibles open, and we want to pray scripture, and we want to discuss after we gather here, we want to discuss with one another. Um, when I was in high school, uh, my family planted a church, um, and we wouldn't have said it like this. But as I reflect back, we operated as if in order for us to be as inviting as possible, in order for us to be as attractive as possible, in order for us to be as irresistible and appealing and welcoming to people as possible, that we needed to, to turn down the scripture. Because scripture might weird people out, or there might be things that offend people, or there might be things that... So we need to, to turn it down. We just need to dial it down. We're not going to abandon it. We just... Let's put it in the room underneath the stairs in the closet, and it can live there in our house as a church. And looking back, I just think this was totally foolish, and here's why. Because it's the word of Christ that actually creates the kind of community where you wear the clothes of Christ and you experience the peace of Christ. And so as you dial up the word of Christ, you actually become the most attractive that you could possibly be. Everybody's looking for a community of people that puts on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and bears with one another and forgives with one another and above all puts on love. That's what everybody's looking for. And Paul says the way that you find that is in Christ. And so let the word of Christ, the message and all of its beauty and all of its power, let it dwell richly so that the treasure that it is actually gets experienced. Let it out. And be willing as you let it out in all wisdom to teach and admonish one another with it. That is, encourage one another, warn one another, correct one another when necessary, but make sure you explain it clearly to one another. Take the word seriously if you want to become this kind of loving community. And so as a church, would we have the courage to speak the word and the courage to receive it? Would the word be dwelling richly in our groups and in our classes and in our next-gen ministries, in our homes? And the specific application of this text in verse 16 is that the word would dwell richly in our singing We are to sing through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I don't actually know what the difference in those is. You can ask Evan. He probably knows. (laughs) 
but we are to be a singing people. In a Christ-centered community, the word of Christ dwells richly. And here's the final thing. Number five, to be a Christ-centered community, we work in Christ's name. We work in Christ's name. Look at verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What does that mean? What does it mean to do everything in Jesus' name? Well, I think there's a hint in that he says, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do everything in the name of King Jesus. Remember in Colossians 1, it says that God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. And so we live in a new kingdom. So to do everything in the name of the king means to live as if we've been rescued and we live in this new kingdom. We live in the light of the fact that Jesus is Lord. All of our words and all of our works reflect the fact that Jesus is our king. And so we give him access to every area of our lives. What does that practically look like? He says, do everything. That's a pretty broad. So let me give you two kind of fun examples. If you love to snowboard or if you love to bake, what does it mean to do snowboarding and baking in the name of the Lord Jesus? Giving thanks to the Father through him. What does that mean? Well, with snowboarding, you can snowboard knowing that giving thanks to the Father, saying the Father is the one who's given me my body. You know, not everyone can snowboard. And God is the one who's given us the snow and the mountain. And God is the one who's given us the technology to figure out how to do this thing and to engineer the mountain. And God is the one who's given us the freedom and the peace in society for us to have leisurely activities like snowboarding. If we were at war, we wouldn't be going to snowboard. And so I'm going to go down this mountain on this snowboard as if I belong to Christ and this stuff is a gift from him. What about baking? The father has given me my taste buds. The father is the one who's allowed us to collect spices and flavors from all over the world. The father is the one who's given us the resources to bake. The father is the one who's given us the technology to bake. The father is the one who's allowed us to have wisdom from trial and error of those who have come before us from generations before us to allow us to bake. And so I'm going to bake like I belong to Christ and like he's the king. So then what does that actually look like? I don't know. Here are some ideas. It looks like snowboarding and baking as if this is a gift to be enjoyed, not a purpose to be lived for. This is a gift to be enjoyed, not a purpose to be lived for. When you're baking or when you're snowboarding, you don't have to think, ah, I should really probably be spending time at church or doing some kind of uh, other. Enjoy the gift. Enjoy it. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. But as you enjoy the gift, do not confuse it for a purpose to be lived for. Life is all about the mountain. It's all about the kitchen. I think doing it in Christ's name means doing your best as you snowboard. Doing your best as you bake. And I think it looks like trusting God with the result. The mountain didn't have good snow today. That's disappointing, but it doesn't have to crush you. It doesn't have to ruin your life. The cake didn't turn out. Well, It doesn't have to crush you. It doesn't have to ruin your life. Maybe you're not going to win the bake-off, but it's okay. It's, It's a thing to be enjoyed, not a purpose to be lived for. Now, these are kind of silly examples, 
as we think about snowboarding and baking. But now apply everything I just said to your role as a mom, to your role as a husband, to your role as an employer or an employee. And that's what Paul is going to talk about in the next section of Colossians. Do everything as if you belong to Christ. Are you living your life like you belong to a kingdom that's above? Well, then seek the things that are above where Christ is. Set your mind on the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Would we be a community that is so heavenly minded that we are a lot of earthly good? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sending your son. God, we recognize that this was an act of love. And we thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross to demonstrate just how much you love us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for raising Jesus from the dead and making us alive together with him. Would you help us to be your church, to clothe ourselves with Christ, to referee ourselves with the peace of Christ? Would the word of Christ dwell richly here? And would we do everything as if we belong to Christ? It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?